Hollywood Crime Scene. I'm Joe Hollywood, and once again, I am joined by Imagine O's Pete. Hey, hey, I missed that tune. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes. It's got a beat, and you can dance to it. Yes, you can dance to it. And Andrew Walker is here once again. Andrew, Andrew what's, Slow, what's slow Waltz Walker. That, <laughs> that's, that would be a slow waltz, right? There we go. That type of music. There I'm not go. familiar with uh, that type of music. Music. I picked I picked it because it had sort of a noirish yeah. theme back alley, rainy night in LA sort of a thing. It kind of conjured that mood. Right. Um, I could hear a gumshoe talking about it. <laughs> exactly. it, was cold, it was a cold rainy night. She looked at me <laughs> across the bar. She had legs that went up to her neck. Yeah. Uh yeah, so our topic today is going to be uh onset accidents and deaths. And Throughout the history of Hollywood, uh, there is no shortage of these things. And in the early days of Hollywood, there were no rules. There were no laws. It kind of reminds me of the early days of football when they would wear leather helmets and they said that during any given college football season, there'd be like three or four deaths a season. Oh wow! Uh, it was kind of the same thing in the early days of Hollywood where – numerous uh extras and stunt people uh would die and they would say oh, well and move on to the next one until some people got involved and said okay we need to put some it's rules wild, in place it's the wild west exactly literally because they were yeah. shooting a lot of these happened on westerns um one of the first filming accidents uh, was during the filming of a movie called across the border in 1914 while filming in Colorado, actress Grace McHugh was filming a scene where she was crossing the Arkansas River. The boat she was in capsized, and camera operator Owen Carter jumped into the river to save her. Both drowned. Oh, hey. uh, so that was in 1914, and he was uh, honored posthumously uh, for his heroic actions uh, after the fact. A movie called The Captive, released in 1915, uh, you just mentioned his name a moment ago. Director Cecil B. DeMille, mm -hmm. or is it Cecil? Yeah. Uh, he had extras use live ammunition to fire <laughs> at a locked door. They were trying to break down a door. Uh, he then told the extras for the next scene to reload with blanks for the next shot. But one of the extras left his live round in the gun and shot and killed another extra, oh. Charles Chandler, in the head. Uh, I have a feeling we might revisit that theme in a little bit. <laughs> oh, yeah. You think, man, that was more than 100 years ago. Things have not changed all that much. Uh, the Great Circus Mystery, 1925. Stuntmen Frank Tully and Tony Brack were killed in an auto accident. The footage was used in the film. Really? Uh, I don't know if it exists on YouTube or something like that. I haven't bothered to look that up yet, but uh, they said, hey, let's use that. Wow. <laughs> uh, that's a take. Print it. Uh, the Warrens of Virginia, 1924. In, in November of 1923, Texas, uh, in Texas, they were filming. Uh, Martha Mansfield was wearing a highly flammable Civil War costume when another cast member tossed a match in her direction, <laughs> igniting her costume. Uh, others tried to save her, but she died the next day. Oh that feels goodness. deliberate. <laughs> that sounds deliberate. Licking a match and yeah. watching your co-worker go up in flames. <laughs> Holy <Yeah>. moly. <laughs> I mean, what was that made out of? Uh, Taffeta, like uh, something. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah. yeah, Sprayed with uh, hairspray oh uh, to keep it in place. Yeah. Now, there were always rumors of uh, the Charlton Heston Ben-Hur having uh, some accidents. I don't know about that, but in the 1925 version, a stuntman died during the chariot race filmed at Circus Maximus in Rome on location uh, when a wheel broke off his chariot. Uh, he was killed during filming. Uh, King of the Jungle, 1927, Gordon Standing was mauled by a lion on set and died from his injuries. Uh, I don't think it was the famous lion that we saw at the beginning of uh, MGM movies, but um, imagine that. What a way to go. Holy moly. Uh, this one is sort of ironic. Noah's Ark, uh, released in 1928. Three people died. One man lost his leg, and several were, were injured during the filming of The Great Flood. 
Uh, immediately after that, Hollywood thought it might be a good idea to introduce some safety regulations on film sets. You don't how, say. <laughs> how, how ironic. Exactly. My God. The, 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 the arc that saved humanity so that we could all live and repopulate the earth. Exactly. Ended up killing two or three people. Yeah. You mean we can't use real dynamite? <laughs> Uh, the Trail of 98, this would be 1898, uh, released in 1928. Three stuntmen died during uh, filming uh, on the Abercrombie Rapids. Apparently, they must have fell from their boat and drowned uh, in the rapids. Uh, there were countless, too many to name, several uh, aviation deaths in the 1920s. Uh, they were, you know, this was kind of a new thing. This aviation yeah. thing was new yeah. and we got, we got to do something more exciting uh, in our films, but people were crashing and dying Man all the Man defying the laws of gravity in this new contraption. Can you guys do a loop? Yeah. And do it again. Like, oh, we got it, but let's do one more for safety. And then, uh, yeah. Uh, three pilots were killed during the filming of Hell's Angels in 1930. And again, this is, this is sort of interesting. Uh, the producer director on the film was Howard Hughes. And I had read that, uh, he wanted to do this really crazy stunt and the stuntman said, no, we're not going to do it. And he said, yes, you will. And they said, no, it, it's, it, we can't pull it off. So Howard Hughes, who was an aviator himself, climbed into the plane, uh, tried to pull off the stunt, crashed and was badly injured, uh, needed like facial reconstruction and everything. So Howard, what did we learn? <laughs> that you need to wear shoe boxes on your feet. Um, another 1930 film, Such Men Are Dangerous, was the name of the film. I love that title. That needs That's screaming for a remake. Now, get this. I shouldn't make light of this. Ten men were killed. <laughs> Ten men were killed when two camera planes collided over the ocean, um, and everyone was lost. All kinds, like... Directors and producers and actors and camera operators. Ten crew members were lost. Uh, when the families tried to sue the Fox Film Company, the courts ruled in favor of the studio. That's how crazy things were back then. Ten men lost on one production. All that ocean, and they flew at they each other. They crashed in each other. Yeah, into each other. Yep. Was it the Bermuda Triangle? Or was it? <laughs> and and uh, Errol Flynn, you know, he, he did a lot of those uh, movies with – the Calvary coming to the rescue. And, and back in the day, you know, they used to use trip wires where they would trip horses and they would break their legs and they would drag them out of the shot and bring in some new horses and do the same thing until PETA got involved. You know, I don't know if it was PETA at the time, but uh, they just were shameless in, in uh, killing horses and stuff uh, during filming. Um, but during a, a, the filming of a movie called uh, they died with their boots on 1941. I think this was a story of Custer. Uh, three horsemen died during the Calvary charge. Uh, extra Jack Budlong was on a horse that would, tripped and was stumbling. And knowing that he was going to hit the ground, he was carrying a sword. He threw it away from himself to not get injured, but it, it landed handle down and stuck in an upright position, which he then <laughs> fell on and impaled himself and died. Oh my um, God! You know, and had, he was riding right next to Errol Flynn, so Errol Flynn, you know, witnessed it happen. You know, two quick things: Errol Flynn has been mentioned a lot of times in our podcast, and I have to feel like we have to nominate him for some award yeah. <laughs> because it, it, whenever we Errol, Errol Flynn's in Hollywood crimes crime scene podcast, yeah. And the other one is I would never work on any of these movies that says they die. It's dangerous. As a stuntman, yeah. like I'm going to work on my mother's cast. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, you know, Errol Flynn. Uh, he, uh, he wrote an autobiography, which I've been meaning to read, called uh, My Wicked, Wicked Ways. And uh, wow. he was, uh, you know, the I'm reading that. early <laughs> Hollywood bad boy. And um, But, yeah, those movies back then when they would have the, the Calvary charging, they were just no soul, no heart. They would just trip these horses and break their legs. And uh, it's hard for me to go back and watch some of those movies knowing what they were capable of back then. And now I join you in that. It's yeah. going to be hard for me to watch those now going, oh, it that's... It's tough. Um, so, you know, those were all 1941 and, and earlier. And even though things were put in place to try and make sets safer, people continue to die during the, the filming of movies, which makes my brain hurt. Like, this is entertainment. Every safety precaution should be taken into consideration, yet people 
uh, continue to die. One of the more famous uh, incidents took place in uh, 1983. And uh, Imaginos Pete, I'm going to turn it over to you. Yeah, uh, I ended up getting the Twilight Zone movie, which was, you know, it was wildly popular. People were looking. Warner Brothers had, uh, had acquired the rights for it. They budgeted $10 million for this movie, and we're going to use it as an annual showcase. Four segments, four directors, and it was so popular, people thought that every year four new directors would get the chance to showcase it. And so you had John Landis, Joe Dante, George Miller, Steven Spielberg. That's a hell of a lineup to lead off of. Mm-hmm. Landis uh-huh. was fresh off of you know, doing American Werewolf in London. He had done Blues Brothers. George He'd... Miller did... Uh... The Mel Gibson movie, yeah. Mad Max, Mad, Mad Max, Max, yeah. yeah. Wow. So you know, so there was a good lineup, and to do the Twilight Zone, and they'd all loved it. And Landis' segment was up first, and he was doing this thing with a uh, character actor, Vic Morrow, who was mm-hmm. great. And so it was going to be a uh, uh, Bill Connor, who's a bigot, and then he's going to relive. You know, what's it like to be on the receiving end of bigotry that you practice and all that stuff? And he, it, the scene, his segment had to get a rewrite because, of course, John Landis wrote a character that had no. Redemption. The character was a bigot to start with and was a bigot at the end of it. Didn't learn anything. So the execs said, hey, this guy has to have a change of heart. So they wrote a scene in there for a Vietnam, uh, Viet, uh, during the Vietnam War, a village where the character would save a couple of Vietnamese kids from American GIs. The suits greenlit it. And then when the time came, Landis, you know, say what you want. I, I, I don't know the man, so obviously I can't judge, but. You know, if being if being an a hole and a cynic was a crime, I'd have consecutive life sentences. You know? So I, I, you know, it's but that being said, when you hear about this accident where on the on this, Vic Morrow was supposed to take two kids. First of all, child labor laws were very you know very strict. Landis wanted to get around them and hired two child actors off the books. Told their families that it'd be safe. The problem with this, the helicopter that was used for the incident, for the shot, ended up, the pyrotechnics were too uh, dangerous, too explosive. The yeah, they were too like heavy. huts because it was set, you yeah. know, in Vietnam. So there were these, you know, wood or straw huts that Patrick, just turned into shrapnel right. when they started igniting the pyrotechnics. Production, the production designer was Patrick Sawyer, and he did a wonderful job. He created a very realistic uh, Vietnamese village. Came time, Landis wanted to move one of the huts. When they moved it, he saw an explosive charge underneath there. And he said, he asked Landis, like, what is that? He says, don't worry about it. It'll be fine. So you're going, whoa, man, this is, you're pretty cavalier. Landis had this history of being, you know, cocky and, and disregarding the rules. And we talk about live ammo that you were t- talking about d- during DeMille's time. A few days before the scene, there's a scene where the GIs are just using ammo to spray the village. They use live ammo with M60s. Mm. Those things have a range of a half mile, and they were in a circle shooting. <laughs> so it's not like they were all just aiming at, at the wall. You know, so there was like a cliff wall that they would just go and the bullets would strike there. Mm. They were shooting in every direction. Yeah, and they used live ammo with M60 because the air bursts weren't enough for Landis. He said, "He said you promised me this," and, and so you're going, "Come on, man, you don't use live ammo." So if that's a per- foreshadowing how things were going to be on set, time came. The Darcy Wingo, who's one of the pilots, and he'd flown in Vietnam and flew, flew the Huey, was flying it and said, hey, it's pitch black. All that I see is darkness, and then when the explosions go off, light. This is not safe. We shouldn't do this. And, the you know, the the came, came time for the shot. Morrow picked up the two, two kids, had to cross this five-foot-deep river and get to the other side. Landis kept insisting that the helicopter fly lower and lower to get that effect, that thing. And everyone's going, dude, this is not right. Mm. You you can't do this. Like, don't worry. And was, they, they pushed through. Was he get, getting the helicopter lower and lower to get, like, a closer shot? No, no or the, the wind effect. I mean, oh, the, the, there were cameramen on board the helicopter, too. To get the effect on the water? Yeah, on like the water. Like that, what they call it, the wash that yeah. comes off the rotors. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Wow. And, and so, you know, Vic Morrow's line was was telling the kids don't worry i'll protect you that's actually one of the lines in there which is kind of you know tragic irony yeah mm. it collapsed it, it comes down the rotors hit them two murrow and one of the children are decapitated oh, and the other yeah. one is crushed by the weight of the helicopter and the bodies that are on them the parents are distraught they're in shock you know everyone's distraught it by the time they go to trial it, it happened in 82 the trial didn't take place till 86 mm. 
Uh. And because the pretrial was live, and the trial ended nine months. If that if that had happened now, that was a nine month trial. That would have been ratings gold because you had the yeah. defense and the pro and the the prosecutor side just lashing at each other. Going back and forth the whole time. And the problem is when you have nothing but eyewitness testimony, memories fade when you're in shock. It's yeah, that many years later. Yeah. The defense attorney for Landis Company was saying, well, these parents are in shock. Who knows what they, memories can, you know, oh, yeah. you told, because the parents like, you never told us it'd be a helicopter and be this dangerous. They found someone who said, hey, no, we were the backup parents in case you guys couldn't do it. And they told us there was a helicopter in there. Oh, it's he okay. said, she said. Mm -hmm. And they had some good studio lawyers. And then, know. but memory, and I hate to say it, but in if your uh, only recourse is, I remember it, well, how, do you? Memories change. Yes. Things get affected over the time. What's weird about that is, uh, and I hate to even mention this, but footage exists of the yes. accident, like uncensored I heard footage that. that I've seen, and it's Today, disturbing. And I, I can't. I, uh, I can't and I don't know that. how yeah. that wouldn't convince any jury that those were unsafe conditions. You know, my, my argument is even back then, even if you said, well, the effects weren't what they were supposed to be back then, the, you suspend this helicopter from a crane and, and you do all that other stuff using fans yeah, or something. Get big yes. industrial fans Don't, 20 feet above yeah. the river or something. What? Why are you flying a helicopter in that environment over actors i'll never understand that and how he got away with that and the thing is if you if you say that okay you know it's a new medium like you're talking about the gold you know pre gold pre-1941 if we're talking about 1914 and say well common sense is still practice in this is 1980 yeah there's no excuse if it's if it's too dangerous don't do it this actually broke the friendship between landis and spielberg yeah i think Spiel i heard that yeah. spielberg came out and said no movies worth dying for. Yes, yeah, exactly. Yes. No I, yeah. movies worth dying for. Yeah. And Landis took this, you know, got upset because there were people, you know, for instance, Eddie Murphy never showed up to the trial and he thought he'd be a good friend to show up and, and support him and all that kind of well, stuff. Well, they had their falling out too, didn't they? They did. Oh, and, but they later did uh, Coming to America. Yeah, yeah. And then they had their little fight. But you, when you interview John Landis, look, it was a traumatic incident. He says it affected him personally. And sure, it did. Yeah, they said yeah. during the trial he was... They said he was stoic and remorseless, but I can't tell. You know, everyone shows grief in their own way. Sure. But I'll tell you one thing: from all the interviews that you see afterwards, and he's been on, you know, on Netflix and say the movies that made us. If you watch him and they reference that stuff, the guy doesn't want to talk. He, he comes across as prickly. Mm -hmm. So now he says, "Well, because I'm, you know, people probably are jealous and hate me, then they'll all come out and talk about me." I said, "Well, you're not doing yourself any favors." Mm -hmm. And but everybody can't be wrong. If the production people, some of his close friends, colleagues, and everyone's saying, dude, you just disregarded safety rules. Like, who fires live ammo? Yeah. Who uses explosions? Who moves trying and says, fly lower, fly lower? And these are kids who... He, child labor law said kids can't work at night. He had to shoot the scene at 2.30 in the morning. You can film it at 8 o'clock. It's night is night. Yeah. Oh, the 2.30 night looks different than the 8 o'clock night. Come on. <laughs> oh, the, the, the darkness. The, 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 sun, the sun is uh, 15 degrees off. We can't, and we can't it's Hollywood. That. There are ways to make it look like yes. night. Yes. Yeah. For God's sakes. This is what, you know, Joe, you are talking about this, and Andrew, you said too. Your job is to be creative. Mm -hmm. Oh, I'm. I, oh, you know what? I, I, I tapped the desk. Yeah, because uh, that's I oh. was getting out. I was getting out. You're talking with your hands, that's just like with my does. hands. Joe, Joe, for everyone, Joe told us in, in the pre-production meeting, like, don't tap the desk because we can hear it. And we're so passionate. Animated. We're so passionate. No, but you, you're right, Joe and uh, and Andrew. You guys, nothing changed. I mean, this that trial had that been happened, I was that this will change Hollywood forever. You know, they they said fixed wings. The rules for fixed wings came in just at before the accident so it was too late and then mm. they added helicopters they amended it to include helicopters after that yeah but things haven't changed no as a matter of fact um 10 years later or so um i remember this this one kind of speaks to me personally because i remember these incidents uh as a young person following uh, the making of the crow the 1994 movie starring uh, brandon lee and I remember, you know, I would always read like the Hollywood section of the newspaper and see what's in production and what's going on. And I remember reading an article about an accident that had taken place on the set of The Crow where a crew member had a screwdriver driven through his hand or something. Yikes. And I was like, Ugh. And then a couple weeks uh, later, I read about another incident. Um, let me see. I have it. Uh, a carpenter was electrocuted when his scissor lift struck power lines. So that was like a few a few weeks after I read about the screwdriver in the hand. And I'm like, 
man, it sounds like that set is cursed. Yikes. I, I regretted thinking that because imagine picking up a newspaper one day, flipping to the entertainment section, or I don't even know it was the entertainment section. It's probably the headline in the newspaper. Brandon Lee shot dead on the set of the crow. So it sounded like it was an unsafe work environment and accidents kept happening and they kept moving forward. Originally, I think they said this movie was going to be like a direct to video thing. And then they realized, Hey, this is looking pretty good. So they went with feature film, you know? And, uh, so on March 31st, 1993 now, so that means just in a couple of weeks, it's going to be the, what? 30th, 30th. 30th anniversary of Brandon Lee's death. Uh, he was shot and killed while filming a scene where his character comes home. He has, he's carrying bags of groceries and, uh, some thugs are brutalizing his fiance. Um, an actor who was playing one of the thugs turns and fires a 44 Magnum at Lee's character. Cameras were rolling. Uh, the, there was a, a squib or something in the, in the, uh, grocery bag that milk was supposed to shed or whatever. Lee goes down. Uh, he was supposed to fall, I think forward or something, but he fell backward. Like he didn't fall on cue. So the director said, cut, you know, we got, we got to do that again. And he's, and Lee stays down. He's not moving. And so someone comes over and, uh, and they didn't see blood right away. So they were trying, they thought maybe he fell and hit his head. They said his breathing suddenly got rapid and then it slowed down and stopped. And, uh, after investigating it, this is what they found out that, they were shooting close-ups of the guns that were going to be used. And it was obvious if there wasn't ammunition in the chambers. So they put uh, what they call dummy rounds in the chambers, so that during the close-ups you would see what looked like a loaded gun. Yeah, Cause it was a revolver. So exactly. You could see. Yeah. So, there, yeah. so then they were supposed to empty the dummy rounds and then put blanks in. Well, at some point, one of those dummy rounds uh, got, dislodged and, and lodged into the barrel of the gun. So it got jammed and nobody knew it. Nobody inspected the gun. So they replaced the dummy rounds uh, with blanks, uh, set up the scene. Uh, the two actors involved were 12 to 15 feet apart. Uh, action, Brandon Lee walks in, the actor uh, pulls the trigger, the blank goes off, which basically treated the dummy round that was lodged in the barrel through the barrel and into Brandon Lee's uh, stomach. Uh, cameras rolled um, and uh, the, the bullet hit and killed Brandon Lee. Uh, it was ruled an accident due to negligence. I know that the actor who had pulled the trigger uh, had been haunted by it his entire life. Sure. Um, he continued to work, um, but he, he died a few years ago, um, but it haunted him. And you could imagine right. Now, my, my argument, and this, this will be sort of a segue uh, to our next segment, um, my thing is whether you're using dummy rounds, whether you're, whether you're using blanks, whatever, why are you aiming the gun at the actor? There's no reason for that. If, if the camera's on you, I could aim over here. Nobody would know right. that it's not aimed at Brandon Lee. I don't understand how anyone would ever aim a gun at another human being on a movie set, whether you're firing blanks or not. The only time I might aim a gun is if it's like a rubber gun that doesn't have right. any mechanical moving parts. Um, it's a dramatic scene. Yeah. Although as a director of photography, you can adjust the scenes where you you pull the gun on someone. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. Um, so then the, the, the footnote on this, uh, there were only three more days left of the film, so most of... Brandon Lee's scenes were done. Um, they obviously argued and debated whether or not they wanted to continue uh, to do the movie. Uh, Miramax swooped in, picked up the film, and invested the money to finish what needs, needed to be shot. They had to rewrite certain scenes because of the accident. Uh, they ended up getting a stunt double who stood in uh, for some of the scenes that needed Brandon Lee in it, and they digitally replaced his face. So this is early CGI of right. replacing this actor's face with Brandon Lee's. Um, eventually the film was released. Uh, I saw it in theaters when it came out. I loved it. Yeah. It was eerie because the premise of the movie is about a guy who 
dies and comes back to life to avenge his his murder and his fiance's murder. And here we were as an audience watching Brandon Lee on screen after knowing he was dead. It, it was so poetic and eerie to watch this yeah. movie. And I absolutely loved it. Uh, it ultimately grossed $93 million on a budget of $23 million. So it was um, enormously successful. And, and critics seemed to like it for the most part. I, wa- um, I watched it once. I rented it probably 10 or 12 years ago. And uh, I liked it. I, I yeah, it was one of those it, movies I'm like I wish I would have saw this a little earlier, but yeah, I I need to revisit it. Yeah, it, it's, it's not de- in like an alternate Detroit, right? Like a, yeah, like a yeah. dark Detroit. Yeah, Detroit. Ernie Hudson's in it, and uh, and and they, you know, there's been sequels and reboots or whatever since then, but I just feel like uh, they've never been able to surpass what was done in that first movie, and there was just something about um, um, Lee that he was so charismatic and so camera ready and it's that's the thing that saddens me the most is thinking what might have been yeah. this would would have been the start of a huge uh, uh movie career following in the footsteps of his father bruce lee um it's it's just sad to think what might have been yeah. over something that should have been preventable on a movie set the gun should have been expected uh, inspected on set um, so, you know, accident after accident after accident on these Hollywood movie sets, you think Hollywood would learn and, and, uh, but that brings us to Andrew's turn, um, to kind of talk about another onset accident that just recently made headlines. Did, before we go any further, did, wasn't there a Crow sequel where somebody died on set also? That I, I don't know there know. was a cross sequel. I didn't hear about anyone dying. I on thought that. I came across that, but we'll have to look that up for okay. another time. Um, yeah, so everyone uh, knows about uh, the movie Rust, uh, or at least should know about it. Alec Baldwin's uh, starring movie. Um, I don't know if there are any other big names in it, uh, but this happened uh, in October of 21. They were on set shooting in uh, on the country out in New Mexico. Uh, some sort of Western movie. I don't know the premise of it. Um, they were doing rehearsals, uh, and he had a firearm, and he was kind of waving it around, saying, okay, I, I'm going to, you know, he's basically talking to the cinematographer and director, saying, okay, I'm going to pull it out like this. I'm going to go like this, you know, just talking through it. Aimed it at the, I believe, the cinematographer and writer or director. Okay. Yep. Fired it. He says he didn't pull the trigger, but all the F- the FBI investigations, all gun experts say the way that that type of gun is, you have to fire. It's just not going to drop. Yeah. You know, it's just not going to go off. And then not just that type of gun. Yes. That specific gun had been inspected numerous times after the accident, and they determined that only upon its like final firing where they had fired it repeatedly yes. in tests, they said there's no way that gun can fire by itself. The, the trigger was pulled. Look, I'm not a weaponsmith uh, or anything, but <laughs> guns don't just go off. Right. Like you actually have to have your finger on the trigger and have some, it could be a hair trigger. You can't just hold a gun without your finger on the trigger and say, hey, guys, look at this. And all of a sudden it just goes bang. Yeah. Wait, can it? Now I'm, now I'm actually not doubting myself. No, no. I, I, I have a family member that works for customs, and we were talking about an incident where someone had claimed to drop a gun and it went off, and my, my family member in customs says, no, no, uh, guns don't go off just by dropping them. You have to pull the trigger. And ironically, I found out later he was right because the gun that was in question was not dropped. It, the trigger was pulled. So, you know, there's... There's a lot of questions there. Why why was he aiming a gun which he knows he he I he didn't and this is he a, didn't intentionally kill these people. Let's you know, No, not I, at all. No. And this is a western, right? So it's a, it's an old six shooter. So it's you have pro- to cock the prob- hammer. Yeah, yeah, it's yeah. got it's got to be cocked. Um the, why was he pointing it directly at these people and it says uh, I'm reading uh they were 2 to 3 feet away from him. Yeah. Um and they were maybe maybe a little bit of like camera equipment or something. And he goes, all right, so I just take it out, out like this and wave it around and go bang. And when he said bang, 
he pulled the trigger and he yeah. he killed the one woman. Helena Hutchins was yep. the cinematographer. Yeah. Uh, the director was Joel Souza. Yep. Uh, he was injured. Um, but yeah, he he never should have aimed that gun. Now there's there's a whole chain of events where you take the link out of that chain, you prevent this from happening. There were gun gunsmiths on set who right. were supposed to inspect the guns and all there that. There was uh, an armorer, Han- an Han- armorer. That's the Hannah, term I'm looking for. Hannah Gutierrez Reed, and she had a reputation of on other sets being fast and loose with live firearms mm. Mm. and they were on the set when they were bored of rust they would go out you know uh 100 yards away and just start shooting it yeah rattlesnakes or now knows? that's what i had read i had read that it's even though sociopathic. live ammunition was banned from the set there were extras in people who brought yes. ammunition on set went out back like you said maybe lined up bottles or something fired live ammunition on set and then when everyone was called back to do a scene they would return the guns. Are, are you kidding me? No, no, no. no. Yeah, that's true. That's and what one, I had read. One more thing uh, from uh, the same woman, uh, Hannah Gutierrez Reed. Her first film, where she was the armor, it was called The Old Way. I never heard of it, but uh, I guess Nick Cage was in it. It says several crew members complained about her handling of firearms, mm. including an incident in which she discharged a weapon without warning and caused lead actor Nick Cage to walk off set. Wow. <laughs> Yeesh. So, uh, so what producer so, does their homework on their on the resume and says, you know, I'm going to so call. I, I wonder, what, I wonder what, what what type of work she's doing these days. Maybe working at McDonald's or. Uh... <laughs> I, I can't be around guns. No. I'll tell Wait, you that. Is she no is she not line. in trouble with the law? She, I mean, she, well, the... her her and uh, Baldwin. Baldwin are under two counts of involuntary manslaughter, which they still have to go to trial. Yeah, so the trial hasn't happened yet. Um, they're just recently they said they're going to proceed with finishing yeah. the movie. Yeah, we'll which see. Which makes my head hurt. We'll see. Um, I I have just a weird feeling that Baldwin's going to walk away unscathed. And yeah, he. It's. I mean, we'll we'll get the evidence during the trial, but. You know, on, on one hand, I agree with you. The gun should never be aimed at somebody. But on the other hand, if someone hands you a gun and tells you it's safe. Uh, who's who's at fault here? It, it's all going to come out in the See, trial. See, this sounds a little bit like Landis. And Landis was saying, well, you know, accidents happen. You know, <laughs> who's who's really to blame for this? I'm like, well, you. You're, you're, the, you're the director on a movie set. Like, everything stops with you. Like, everyone reports to you. And yeah. the way your personality is, you're the top of the pyramid. <laughs> yeah. Like, everybody comes to you. Like, you sign off on everything. You can't feign yeah. ignorance. You know, when, in, in Rust, when you pass it, when you said there was a rule like no live ammo on stage. Uh, if Frank, did you bring live ammo? Yeah, I'm bored. Read a book. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Landis. Let let thee who has crashed a helicopter yeah. cast the first stone. You, you crashed the helicopter. You know, it's in, we, we did a short film and Andrew was, was uh, played a role in it. And we had a scene where Andrew has to, uh, you know, pass away. We didn't want to, uh, if we want to, uh, Andrew, could you just, we put some sharp broken glass on there. Andrew, light on the broken glass. It'll add to the effect of you being in pain. <laughs> like, we don't do that kind of stuff. Yeah. No, instead they, they made me lay uh, in the rocky uh, Clinton River in Pontiac and uh, <laughs> while, while uh, the non-rouge drowned me. Yeah. <laughs> and we, but we took, we took great care to make sure that, you know, you know nothing happened. Andrew's there. You can yeah, see I, I, I'm still alive. Andrew's, but... And you're safe. Now, you, you were responsible, right? You didn't summon the real Nain Rouge, right? No, we didn't want to. You know, so we, we, no. Hey, you know, we need authenticity. Let's get a real demon. <laughs> like, yeah. no. Everyone gather around. We're going to so draw it, a pentagram. It's, it's hey. not like Landis. We need live ammo. <laughs> I mentioned to you uh, in a text, Nain Rouge uh, Parade, Mar- yeah. March 26th. Ooh. If you want to, I've never been to it. I think it'd be fun just to <laughs> people watch. It's Detroit's Mardi Gras. And hopefully they'll be careful in their parades. And they don't want to use, you know, since we're, with our topic. I mean, it's just, you're right. I, I can't believe this is still happening right now. You Nobody yeah. can feign ignorance. You know, you can't be like the CEO of a company. I can't believe we had child, we were using child labor. Like, Yeah. Now, if if uh, you were a betting man, if, if uh, Vegas posted the odds, what do you predict the outcome of this Rust trial? To the armor is going to prison. Yeah. She she's going to get jail time, and uh, Baldwin will get probation, probably some fine. He'll do community service, uh, anything. And then but maybe prison. an Academy Award next year. And then, <laughs> well, no, he's going to do a documentary on it, and he's mm-hmm. going to win an Emmy for it. Oh, there you go. All right, yeah. 
Andrew, what are uh, your thoughts? So I, I had to read up quickly on the civil lawsuit. So I guess the Hutchins family settled in October. Oh, okay. Yeah. So yeah, they civil, civil is the way to go. So so, it, but is everything taken care of civilly? Well, that means well, it depends on like on the civil court with the Twilight Zone movie. The children's parents were given millions of dollars, and one of the key things in any settlement. There's no admit, admission of guilt, no right. admission of wrongdoing. It's just like when it, when when a corporation spills gas everywhere, or like we didn't do anything wrong, we'll settle with you. But yeah, we technically never did anything wrong. The and books. then there's a non-disclosure agreement yeah. where no one's allowed to speak of it again. Okay, I think, I think it, I think it might be an O.J. Simpson type thing where it ends with the, just civil damages against the. Yeah. Oh yeah, definitely civil um, damages. That's the Hanny, Hannah Gutierrez, Gutierrez uh, Reed woman, the armor. She might get a little bit. Yeah, she's um, she's someone. Someone she has might, to go to jail. She might get a. I don't know, but see, it could be invo- one of those- involuntary involuntary manslaughter is a serious thing, and yeah. I'd have to look up what. Uh, I guess I don't know if they'll be tried in California or tried in New Mexico where it happened, but the minimum's got to be five to ten. Oh sure, for involuntary. I would think so. I, I would. But think- I don't see someone of Alec Baldwin's caliber. You know, I oh, hate, he's not going to do. I nothing, hate. I, no. I hate to say that. But if if one of us three did that, you th- we would more likely go to get five a minimum oh, yeah, five yeah, years. Yeah. Someone like Alec Baldwin, who everyone loves and can, uh, you know, get twenty million dollars a movie. Yeah, might be untouchable. But we'll I, see. I, even I, you know, and even never with say the, never. Even <laughs> with the armor, I think you'll get a prison sentence, but it'll be deferred. Something along those lines. I don't think she'll she'll do the commuted, five to ten yeah. commuted or whatever. Commuted. Yeah, pardoned whatever. Yeah, I think they're probably going to say, "Look, the family was compensated. Let's move on from this." That's yes. that's my prediction. Because what's so. going to happen with this, and uh, and this, I, Joe, I'd love to get your thoughts on this. If you dig into this one, they're going to they they if I go down, everybody goes down. Then we start digging into accents elsewhere, and the producers are going to go, "Whoa, whoa, whoa no, no, don't look and at my gonna, movie." And yeah, it's going to put put a chilling effect on yeah everything. Hopefully, it's it spurs some action to be like, okay, we Hollywood, you need to tighten up. Oh yeah, like all, you know, all, all hundred years ago when this stuff yeah, was happening, right. and it's still happening. Right. And here's well, some other. Yeah, I wanted yeah. to throw out a couple of other things that have happened within fairly recent memory. There was a movie called Vampire in Brooklyn, starring Eddie Murphy, mm-hmm. came out in 1995. Uh, Angela Bassett, uh, her character was just supposed to fall from a tall building. Uh, the filmmakers uh, hit up a bunch of uh, stunt women to do the stunt, and they said, "No, the uh, the math doesn't." Uh, add up the the physics doesn't add up this isn't going to work out and so they would go on to the next stunt woman and the next stunt woman until a young aspiring stunt woman sonia davis said i'll do it so they oh they put her in uh you know angela bassett's costume put her on the top of a building they said all right we got an airbag here in the alley you just need to uh, fall backwards onto the airbag so she fell from the top of the building and only partially hit the airbag. Uh, her top half hit the pavement. Ugh. And so despite the warnings of all the stunt people who said no, this woman wanted to make a name for herself. She did the stunt and paid the price. Um, shocking. Um, Midnight Rider, the Greg Allman story. Um, it, yeah. was, it was filmed in 2014, never was released because of the onset accident. Uh, second camera assistant Sarah Jones was struck and killed by a freight train on February 20th, 2014, as they attempted to shoot a kind of a dream sequence yeah. on a uh, railroad trestle. They had a hospital bed, um, and they thought, now this is what I recall reading, they thought they knew the train schedule. A train had passed by earlier, and they thought they were good for the rest of the day. So they dragged this bed onto the the bridge there, the trestle. Uh, They start filming, and then all of a sudden you hear it up the track. And they're like, oh, there's another train coming. As they tried to clear the track, the train couldn't stop. And what I remember, uh, and again, there's footage of the incident online. Um, From what I read, the the train struck the bed, which then struck the uh, yeah. camera assistant. And, and it struck it at full killing. force because the train conductor said, there's no stopping. Yeah, yeah. And the footnote on that is the crew had no permits, got no permission. They just were doing guerrilla filmmaking. And it, it cost a life. It took a life. And it just infuriates me because, yeah. like I said, this is entertainment. This is film. This stuff shouldn't be happening. It's it's logic. It, 
have some intern stand 500 yards at the bend because I even saw the footage. There's a bend where it comes around. It's like a blind bend mm-hmm. when you hear it. Have an intern standing 500 yards going, guys, there's a train. That's it. Yeah. What do you think of that? They had to wait till they hear. Do you guys hear a train? Oh, boy. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Man, I, I just don't understand how it continues to happen. It's going to happen again. I'm sure we haven't seen the last of this. I Earlier, I was uh, searching. You have green screen now. <laughs> yeah, right, yeah, exactly. being danger series. You have post-production. Yeah. <laughs> um, I, was, I was trying to do a compare and contrast of uh, typical Hollywood occupations versus most other occupations, right. and, like, at least within America, in terms of, uh, fatalities and injuries, and I couldn't come up with any just in the last couple minutes. But common injuries in film production include, and they just got a couple of them, some that we talked about, some maybe we haven't talked about, tripping hazards such as cables, wiring, ropes on set, injuries from pyrotechnic effects including explosives and incendiary devices, vehicle crashes, particularly mm-hmm. in the use of helicopters for filming sequences. Oh, yeah. God. Electrocution hazards, fallen equipment and props, and insufficient or non-existent safety equipment on set. Yeah. So, speaking of accidents, there was a fairly recent movie. You guys might have to help me out. There was a motorcycle accident where a stunt woman crashed a motorcycle. I want to say it was Deadpool, but I'm not positive. You might have to look that up. Right. Um, But that was fairly recently. And, you know, yeah, motorcycle accidents, car accidents, those things things happen but again i i feel like they shouldn't be so common on movie sets there's right. all kinds of precautions that should be in place um now i i teased you guys before we started recording I, as i was researching this i stumbled onto this and i couldn't believe it i i i didn't think this was real so i i verified it by several different sources um you know the movie The Passion of the Christ yes. came out in 2004. Yes. Uh Jesus was played by actor Jim Caviezel. They're making a sequel. Um, are they a sequel? I just heard uh spoiler alert. Um yeah, <laughs> Jesus comes back. <laughs> yeah, uh, I was going to say Mel, Yeah, Mel, Mel Gibson and Caviezel are Yeah. Yeah. So, so he I get he's got a script. Anyway, keep going. But get this. You mean <laughs> the Bible? What's that? The Bible's the script? I mean, what, what, I would imagine. He comes yeah. back and then what? It's just the resurrection. Oh, two hours, yeah. two, two hours two of resurrection. Hours. That'll be two yeah. hours well spent. I don't know. I, I hear the author's good. Um, <laughs> Jim Caviezel, during the filming of something, I don't know. They said he was on the mount, so I don't know if he was on the cross or what. <laughs> was struck by lightning, not once, but twice during the filming of Passion of the Christ as he's depicting Jesus. Huh. <laughs> wow that i'm like this can't possibly be real and apparently it is absolutely a fact that no. jim caviezel was struck by lightning I, during the filming of passion the only of the thing that would make it weirder if it was a clear day <laughs> right yeah <laughs> if it's a clear day then you're Where going did oh boy that come from so i don't know someone trying to send a message and i don't know if i would risk revisiting that story uh, based on that, because they angered someone, and it, it wasn't the name Rouge. It was yeah. God the Father. It was it was Yahweh. Still, it was it was the Jewish guy. You know, I, I, when I, I now that you say, I now remember hearing something about a Passion of the Christ, a sequel. I said, what 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 sequel? That's like saying Titanic the sequel. Like, what are we doing? Right. Yeah. Well, Titanic the sequel w- would literally be James Cameron going to the bottom of the ocean. The sequel of Passion of Christ. Uh, since you're Hindu, I'll let you know. It's uh, Jesus comes back, you know, rises from the dead three days later. And then does what? The, the, and then he gets he revenge. Spreads, spreads the gospel. <laughs> the Apostle Thomas goes all the way to India. India. I thought I thought he resurrected and then left. Like he came out of the cave and then gone. He was, he was here for 40 days and then he uh, ascended. Okay, 40 days? 40 days. There you yeah. go. See, you learn something new every day. Right. Yeah, at least I do. Yeah. So uh, I, I'm wanna... thinking it, it'll focus on those 40 days. I mean, it has to, right? I hope we're not spoiling anything for our listeners, <laughs> but uh, well, I, we can it's speculate. On, it's on Wikipedia. That's where I got it from. Well, I, I still think he's going to get like a AK-47 and uh, exact revenge on the Romans. <laughs> <laughs> It'll be like Quentin Tarantino. All <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we. that's what we need. The all, all revisionist ending. Yeah. Jesus Christ 6. Too fast, too furious. <laughs> Thou shalt not kill for now. <laughs> the reckoning. Yeah. <laughs>
Uh, so yeah, so this stuff uh, just continues to happen, and um, I don't know what Hollywood can do to uh, try to make these environments more safe for people involved. You, um, you need one courageous prosecutor to send someone of note to prison. Yeah, that's it. Yeah, one they, they someone of note to prison. Message. Yeah, when you were rattling off all yeah. those different causes, I, I, as I was researching this, I saw accidents involving lighting equipment that were was too hot, yeah. uh, things like that. And one thing that drove me crazy, it was a repeating theme that I saw. Um, in a lot of cases where someone was injured on set, the, the uh, studios would like heavily medicate them and say, just get through the pain and keep going. And within a year or two, they would be dead because... Uh, the studios would put them on these meds, these painkillers, and say, just get through it. And then they get addicted to the, the medications as they're dealing with the and, pain and suffering. And, 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 of course, the family yeah. wouldn't be able to sue the studio because the yeah. studio would have it's some a, nice lawyers. And, oh, sure. And, I mean, they signed a contract. Oh, my gosh. I, yeah. I, I, you I get to do anything that, to you. That's, that's serious. I mean, yeah, what, that didn't we talk about Wizard of Oz? Like, is this lead paint? Don't worry about it. Yeah, him. yeah, I remember. Well, yeah, so well, Buddy was it Buddy Epson? Uh, Buddy Epson was originally cast as the Tin, tin Man, man and, and they used yeah. a powder to coat his face with tin or whatever, and he inhaled it. It got into his lungs. He was hospitalized and almost died. So, what did the studio do? They quietly recast you're, you're the playing. role yeah. with Jack Haley, and there's still remnants of of uh, Buddy Epson. When you listen to some of the music cuts in the film, you still hear Buddy Epson's voice. Uh, you know, oh. in the film, I don't know. So, I, I didn't. I did yeah, know. yeah. I thought he was a hundred percent completely. No, there's there's little it. remnants of okay. uh, reminders that he was originally cast uh, as the Tin Man, um, and you know he he just lamented and and you know mourned the loss of that opportunity. But then of course he right. gained fame as as uh, Jed Clampett on the Beverly Hillbillies. <laughs> yes. Uh, another accident that happened on the set involved Margaret Hamilton. Uh, where she was supposed to drop through uh, a door, uh, and then they were supposed to light the fireball yep. uh, as she exits Munchkin Land, and apparently the timing was off, and the fireball was ignited before she dropped all the way through, igniting her <laughs> copper in her makeup. So her she was screaming as her makeup burned with the <laughs> copper in it, and, and they they saved her, and they you know got her clean but uh i think she filed the lawsuit down the road from the pain and injury suffered on the wizard and the of rest Oz. of her life she really did look like the wicked witch yeah. <laughs> yeah. unfortunate yeah. come on man <laughs> as if we weren't blasphemous enough for this <laughs> no. segment i mean but yeah there's no she, shortage she, she of needed these an, things like an even skin tone because of the burns so she said hey look Everybody knows me as green. I'm just going to be green the rest of my life, and it, it worked out well for just, her. I'm glad you're just doubling down on this. It worked out well for her. So You know, I don't know about you guys. I'm planning on doing she, a remake of the Hindenburg, and I'm going to use real hydrogen gas. I mean, that's the only way to get authenticity. <laughs> is, she, is, she, is she buried at uh, Forest Lawn? Uh, I don't know where <laughs> Margaret, joking, uh, where she ended up. But uh, I love the story that she tells when uh, she was contacted by her agent and said, hey, uh, MGM's interested in uh, in having you in The Wizard of Oz. and she said, oh, my God, it was my favorite story as a child. What role do they want me to play? And they said, the witch? She was like, what? I was going because for Dorothy. I don't know if you've seen the photos, but they actually had originally cast a beautiful woman as the witch. They were going for the um, Snow White Queen look, okay. like the beautiful, oh, evil witch. Right. Um, and there's there's photos of her, uh, you know, all dressed up like the witch. I think her name was Gail Sondergaard, I want to say. Um and they just realized the beautiful witch wasn't going to work. So they went with Margaret. And, of course, she was freaking awesome in it. She was incredible. Um, so, yeah. But, yeah, it's amazing to think that even a film like Wizard of Oz has uh, had yeah. its share of accidents and, and that stuff just uh, You know, now that you're talking, now it makes me think about Gone with the Wind. How many of those soldiers, were re people, those extras <laughs> were really injured? Like, oh, man, now I don't know. That's so, right. Some of those extras really got like, yeah. like <laughs> dysentery and scurvy and stuff. <laughs> That's right. Or shot with live ammunition. That's and, a fake just, amputation, right? <laughs> no. Yes. Oh, wow. How, you pulled the trigger and he dropped late, so let's put some live ammunition in These there. These are real right? cannonballs, yeah. right? <laughs> Look into it. Oh, you, know, you just reminded me, uh, another accident that doesn't wasn't necessarily on set, but um, was it? Oh, I hope I get the, the person right. I want to say Buster Keaton 
uh, was doing a promotional thing where they were photographing uh, the actors to promote one of the silent films that he had done. And there was like some props nearby, I guess, for him to mess with. And he picked up what he thought was a prop bomb. And I envision, and I don't know if this is the case, but I envision one of those black circular bombs with a wick coming yeah. out of it. And I think he lit it, you know, to pose for a photo, and it exploded. Yeah. He lost three fingers, I think. And uh, the rest of his career, he wore a glove um, to hide the fact that he was uh, missing fingers. I came across that on... Uh, was that with, Buster Keaton? Cause it, it was somebody I, I came it's across. It's either Buster with. Keaton or Harold Lloyd. Um, I don't think it was Keaton. Uh, uh, look it up. Can do you, can you yeah. have access to that real quick? Yeah. It was either Buster Keaton or Harold Lloyd. But, um, yeah, imagine... A live bomb oh is uh, used as a prop, and you're like, oh, let me light this wick, and it goes off in his hand, and he loses fingers. I mean, it, it shouldn't be a fine line between the dedication to art and safety. It should be a really thick line. There should be like a big delineation between dedication to the art and yeah. safety. This is... Speaking of Harold Lloyd, he did a movie called Safety Last, and um, and it's the famous scene where he hangs from the hands of a clock. Oh, my God. When you see how they filmed that, he was actually in no danger at all. They were on the top of a high-rise in downtown Los Angeles, um, but I saw a video that revealed that they used camera illusion to make it look like he was hanging above the street when in reality if he had fallen he would have fallen onto a, a mattress right beneath him this just dawned on me now we're talking about this i want to know how many times outside of jackie chan himself on his movies oh. how many because he oh, always gets yeah. hurt yeah, and yeah. then they put him in the credits yeah. the, the post credit scene or as they roll credits you see all the accidents there was one in uh i think it was rumble in the bronx when jackie leaps uh onto a boat or something and shattered his ankle yeah. and, and they oh. put that in there and he had to wear like a, a rub a cast with a rubber shoe stretched over the cast for was it armor of the gods where he jumped and the branch broke and yeah. he fell and he, and it's, he actually cracked his skull and he had yeah. to, it, it, that was the closest he's year. had some nasty nasty accidents and that's him Michelle so Yeoh. they do that to the star imagine all the stunt <laughs> guys yeah yeah i found the uh, harold lloyd so it was harold lloyd who had the the mom august 24th in 1919, so yeah, long time ago, while posing for some promotional still photographs in the L.A. Witzel Photography Studio, he picked up what he thought was a prop bomb and lit it with a cigarette. <laughs> oh. it, it exploded and mangled his right hand, causing him to lose a thumb and forefinger. Oh. It was severe enough that the cameraman and prop director nearby were also seriously injured. Wow. Oh, my God. Why? Why was a live bomb? Also badly burning his face and chest and injuring his eye. Uh, but he did retain his sight. As he recalled uh, 11 years later, I thought I would surely be so disabled that I would never be able to work again. I didn't suppose that I would have one five hundredth of what I have now. Mm. Still, I thought, life is worthwhile just to be alive. I still think so. I would imagine so yeah, after that incident, the one who you're would, going to appreciate it. wear that special like, glove. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right, so Harold Lloyd. I only recently started getting into his films, but that, I, that honestly, safety laugh, the sa safety last is a work of art. Like, it is spectacular. For Never our YouTube audience and for our, 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 our podcast audience, if I'm laughing, it's out of the absurdity. It's not, <laughs> yeah. it's, it's just, I mean, it almost sounds cartoonish. You pick up the one. This is not real, right? Yeah, <laughs> and it's, it says it says like Acme TNT on it, just like yeah. just just like a Coyote Roadrunner. He's like, hey, yeah, Dina Mitte. Oh, it's starting to actually go down. It hey, reminds me of the get his uh, photo. <laughs> Boom! It reminds me of the scene in the uh, the Batman uh, theatrical release with Adam West. Do you remember when he's running a, the fishing pier with a yeah, bomb in yeah, his hand yeah. and? Yeah. There's, and it there's lasts a for like nun, three minutes. and there's a baby in a stroller <laughs> yeah. and a family of ducks, and he turns to the camera basically and says, "Some days you can't get rid of a bomb." Yeah, love that. But it was that cartoony black bomb with right. a wick on it. But yeah, it's it's, gosh, it's weird to think that again that that was on set or nearby at the studio, and uh, what did they they put explosives in this thing like? Did these black bombs actually exist? I thought that was a Hollywood fabric. Yeah, you could probably buy them on any any street corner. <laughs> yeah. You know, black bombs for thirty five cents. Yeah. <laughs> you know, they're, they're better, cheaper if you get them in a dozen. Buy them bulk. <laughs> hey, you want to go out and uh, you you forgot your fishing pole and you want to catch some fish out in the water? Throw one of these in there and bring a net.
<laughs> Catch them oh by the gross. Yeah. But you know what? This kind of makes sense when you talk about these old time incidents because, uh, slight plug, but Perry Mason just came out, season two just started on HBO Max. If anyone gets a chance to watch it, it's a great show. It shows 1920s LA. Oh, yeah. And you look at the environment. We were talking about the corruption with the cops and everything. So when it comes to the studios, why not? Why not bombs on the corner? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You know, you got me wondering. I, I should have dug this up. I wonder who the most famous person was who passed away on set. I, I would have to think Vic Morrow's up there, but can you guys recall of any other like famous actors who may have been injured or killed on an onset accident other See, than, Oh, Brandon Lee, I guess. I, I would right say Brandon there. Lee yeah. because honestly, he I've never the seen the, the twilight movie and I'd never heard of that actor. Yeah. Um, well, he was a character actor, but you know, he'd yeah. done a lot of his work in the sixties and seventies. Now, am I mistaken or did Bruce Lee also die on a movie set? No, no, no. He had a, a heart enlargement or, or heart to defect medication or was the thing. Yeah, he was at a friend's house and he went to sleep on a they couch. They were filming a movie. Yeah, were, but he was in the process. Yeah. Yeah, so oh, they had to, okay. they had so to maybe that's finish that movie uh, with a stunt oh, double was, or yeah, something. Yeah, it was the one with yeah. uh, Kareem in it. Oh, my Game God. Game of Death, I think, Thank was you. the one. Kareem yeah. was in it? Yeah. Kareem, yeah, he fought uh, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar in Game of Death. Oh, yeah. God, I got to see that. Oh, that was one, yeah. of the, it was one of the best fight scenes. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, I would say... Yeah, Brandon Lee is probably at Brandon the top Lee. of that list. But yeah, in terms yeah. of being seriously injured, oh. Yeah, man. Man, now... You know, I was reading a lot who gets injured, even when he was younger, uh, was Harrison Ford. Oh, sure. Oh, he, he broke his back on uh, Star uh, Wars. Uh, Force Awakens. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, so did... Uh, J.J. Abrams, because he ran over there to help yeah. him out, but he didn't tell anyone on set because he, he wanted to still be the tough director. But he used that time where they couldn't film there on the Millennium Falcon yeah. to rewrite Ray and Finn's Finn, yeah, yeah. um, kind of interaction there to yeah. make it a little bit better. Right. And I'm glad they did because it, it was better than I mean, did Harrison Did Harrison get, get injured in any of the Indiana Jones movies? I, can't, I think I other than being really, really sick that one time and yeah. changing the scene from a long, drawn-out fight to shooting the uh, swordsman. Oh, that was uh, wise because he was he was exhausted. The or? whole cast and crew were terribly sick, uh, and he that. said, "Look, I'm not in the mood for this." So they he goes, "How about if I just sh shoot the son of a bitch?" And that's what they did. I think I think <laughs> I came across a, scene. Uh, a couple other ones like in the '90s, like Patriot Games or one other yeah. action movie where he got. You know, like a rib broken. Oh, yeah. uh, Lord in Lord of the Rings when they filmed it. That I love watching the behind the scenes stuff. When they did the uh, two towers, Orlando Bloom fell off the horse, broke a rib. Ugh. The stunt double for Gimli, who had to play the shorter actor, he dislocated his knee, mm. and um, uh, Viggo Mortensen, who played Strider or Aragorn, broke his toe while kicking a helmet of an orc. I, oh, I, I yeah, heard that. Yeah, I, I did that, hear yeah. that. And yeah. they used the, Peter Jackson used the take where he <laughs> broke his <Yeah>. foot. <laughs> he broke his toe. You know what? Something similar happened in Citizen Kane. Uh, Orson Welles was shooting a scene where he yes. destroys a room. Yes, I, I read that. And he picked up something made of glass and smashed it, and it cut his hand terribly, and he kept going, and that's what you see in the finished film. Le Leonardo DiCaprio and Django and Chains. I that read that too. too. Yeah, yep. yeah. So yeah. it's like, Hey, don't 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 but, ever. But that's not the director's fault. These are guys no, who no. are lost in their. Yeah, yeah. they're getting uh, carried away. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. All right. Well, that brings us to a close on this episode of Hollywood Crime Scene, uh, and we'll be back in a couple of weeks with a new episode. I think we're maybe talking about doing uh, some real life crimes and deaths that were depicted in film. It sounds good to me. Looking yeah. forward to it. it I'll be like here. Fun. It's good to be back. <laughs> <laughs> it is. All right. Thanks, guys. And thank everybody for listening. We'll see you next time. Peace out.